share an understanding that I have of God and his word, especially as it has to relate to the subject of addiction. I also want to thank you for the prayers and the many acts of kindness that you've shown to, uh, to me and to my family throughout the years, especially uh, for your prayers as it concerned Cindy and her health challenges. Uh, we appreciate so very much your love and your care. And uh, I would be doing a disservice if I didn't take advantage of this opportunity just to say thank you. So thank you very much. I have several resources that I'm going to make available uh, to the office and uh, you can have copies of those made and just some different organizations that if you want to go deeper into the subject of addiction, there are numerous resources that are available through these organizations. So I, I do want you to know that we're going to just briefly touch this morning on the medical science aspect of addiction, but our focus this week is going to be on God's answer to addictions, the spiritual component of addictions, the truths of God that can help us with addictions. According to the Center on Addiction, just chemical addictions, there are 40 million Americans that suffer with a chemical addiction. That's one in seven people suffer with a chemical addiction. So you can see that it's a severe problem and issue. Compare that to heart conditions, there are 27 million. Diabetes, 26 million. Cancer, 19 million. So there are 40 million people in America that suffer from addictions. I think it's very thoughtful and mindful and good leadership on the eldership's part to recognize that there is definitely a need to address addictions from a biblical perspective. God's answer to addictions. What is an addiction? I'd like to ask you to consider that anything that is mood altering can become an addiction. There are chemical addictions, but there are also process addictions. Process addictions are addictions that have to do with the natural processes of life such as eating, such as relating to other people, such as exercise, such as sex. Those are processes of the Bible, of the body, of life that the Bible talks about. What we're going to be doing to, this week is we're going to be combining all addictions together because ultimately there's the same from one to the other. The underlying issues and what happens to the body is very similar. So we're going to be combining all of those addictions together. There are addictions of excess. For example, where that I'm addicted to food and I eat too much. But then there are also anorectic addictions where there is a mood altered, a dopamine fix that can actually be achieved by not eating. And so not eating can also become an addiction. It can also become an addiction. So anything that is mood altering can become an addiction. Even doing something good can become an addiction. If my feeling good about myself is based on good deeds that I do, 
then when I do something good, I get a dopamine fix that rewards me. It produces pleasure. And so I want to do it again. And some people can become addicted to doing good deeds in the sense that it ends up getting to the place that they don't take care of themselves, they don't take care of their family, they're so busy doing for everybody else because they're chasing that fix. That's what makes them feel comfortable. That's what makes them feel pleasurable. So I'd like to ask you to consider that all addictions are unhealthy. All addictions are unhealthy. Someone says, well, isn't being addicted to God healthy? No. All addictions are unhealthy. God does not want us to love Him, serve Him, worship Him, glorify Him because we are addicted to Him. He wants us to be motivated because of His love for us. And actually, as we're going to see this week, it is God's love for us that keeps us from being addicted and helps us to regulate our mood to where if we do go over to the state of addiction to bring us back to being able to manage that addiction to where we're no longer abusing whatever it is that's given us that dopamine fix. Why people use or do certain things that end up being an addiction is a very complicated thing. Generally speaking, however, most people become addicted because they're wanting to feel pleasure, they're wanting to avoid pain, or they're wanting just to feel normal. They're wanting just to feel normal. I'd like to read something to you. This is, uh, again, from the Center on Addiction. And I'd like to ask you to consider that Addictions are a brain disorder. I'd like to ask you to consider that addictions, true addictions, are a disease. An addiction is a disease of the brain. Addictions are idols. All idols do not become addictions, but all addictions become idols. An idol is anything that we depend on in this world for our peace, serenity, security, and self-worth and our survival other than God and His love for us and His providential care. I'd like to read this to you. Addiction as a disease. And I want you to listen critically this week to everything that, that I say. I'm just going to be sharing with you my understanding at this particular time in my life. And I know I'm not having access to absolute knowledge. I'm going to be sharing with you what I believe based on the evidence that I have available to me at this time. And I don't want you to accept it as true unless you can see for yourself from the evidence that it's true. So please listen critically to everything that I share with you. So again, from the Center on Addiction, the disease model of addiction. Addiction is defined as a disease by most medical associations, including the American Medical Association and the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Like diabetes, cancer, and heart disease, addiction is caused by a combination of behavioral, environmental, and biological factors. Genetic risk account for about half the likelihood as to whether or not a person will develop an addiction. Addiction involves changes in the functioning of the brain and the body. These changes may be brought on by risky substance use or behavior, or they may pre-exist genetically. The consequences of Untreated addiction often include other physical and mental health disorders that require medical attention. If left untreated over time, addiction becomes more severe, more disabling, and even life-threatening. It can lead to death. How do substances change the brain? People feel pleasure when basic needs such as hunger, thirst, and sex are satisfied. In most cases, these feelings of pleasure 
are caused by the release of certain chemicals in the brain. Most addictive substances cause the brain to release high levels of these same chemicals that are associated with pleasure or reward. Over time, continued release of these chemicals causes changes in the brain and the brain systems involved with reward, motivation, and memory. When these changes occur in the brain, a person may need the substance to feel normal. The individual may also experience intense desires or cravings for the addictive substance and will continue to use despite the harmful or dangerous consequences. The person will also prefer the drug to other healthy pleasures and even may lose interest in normal life activities. In the most chronic form of the disease, addiction can cause a person to stop caring about their own well-being and to stop caring about the well-being of others. Is an addiction a chronic disease? A chronic disease is a long-lasting condition that can be controlled but cannot be cured. About 25 to 50 percent of people with a substance use problem appear to have a severe chronic disorder. For them, addiction is a progressive relapsing disease that requires intensive treatments and continuing aftercare monitoring and family and peer support to manage their recovery. The good news is that even in the most severe chronic form of the disorder, it can be manageable and reversible, usually with long-term treatment and continued monitoring and support for recovery. So why is willpower not enough? The initial and early decisions to use substances reflect a person's free or conscience choice. However, once the brain has been changed by addiction, the choice or willpower becomes impaired. Perhaps the most defining symptom of addiction is a loss of control over substance use. For example, one of the parts of the brain that's affected is the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe has to do with executive functioning. In other words, we're able to gather information, we're able to reason on it, we're able to prioritize, we're able to delay gratification, we're able to choose what's gonna be best for us and what's not gonna be best for us. So when we use something, a substance, to the point that that part of our brain is diseased, then we're not going to be able to think clearly, make good decisions and choices. We're not going to be able to delay gratification. Our brain has changed to the point that our willpower is not even there. The lack of willpower is one of the symptoms of the disease of addiction. Are people with addictions responsible for their actions? People with addiction should not be blamed for suffering from the disease. All people make choices about whether to use substances. However, people do not choose how their brain and body respond to drugs, alcohol, and any other abusive behavior. Which is why people with addiction cannot control their use while others can. People with addiction can still stop using. It's just much harder than it is for someone who has not become addicted. Why some people say that addiction is not a disease? Some people think that Addiction cannot be a disease because it is caused by the individual's choice to use drugs or alcohol. While the first use or early stage use may be by choice, once the brain has been changed by addiction, most experts believe that the person loses control of their behavior, again, because of the brain being diseased. Choice does not determine whether something is a disease. I'd like to repeat that. Choice does not determine whether something is a disease. Heart disease, diabetes, and some forms of cancer involve personal choice, like diet, exercise, sun exposure, etc. 
A disease is what happens in the body as a result of these choices. Others argue that addiction is not a disease because some people with addiction get better without treatment. People with a mild substance use disorder may recover with little or no treatment. People with the most severe form of addiction usually need intensive treatment followed by lifelong management of the disease. However, some people with severe addiction stop drinking or using drugs without treatment, usually after experiencing a serious family, social, occupational, physical, or spiritual crisis. Others achieve sobriety by attending self-help groups without receiving much, if any, professional treatment. So, because we do not understand why some people are able to stop on their own or through self-help meetings at a certain points in their life, people with an addiction should always seek treatment. So even in the study of addictions, there's not any fast rules that apply to everybody. It's unique and it needs to be treated and addressed in a unique way. Again, what I'd like to ask you to consider this morning, this is just the, the medical part of it, but I believe that we can have this part but still not get at the root of addictions. A lot of people may be addicted to alcohol and they may be able to stop the behavior of not using alcohol or abusing alcohol, but what usually happens whenever the core problem is not dealt with, another addiction will pop up somewhere else. That's why most people who have addictions have many different types of addictions, not just one. And a lot of times they're actually intertwined, We can make it even more complicated. I've worked in the addiction field since 1992. Uh, I worked as a clinical supervisor for an adolescent unit. It was an inpatient program for adolescents and their families. It was a locked program, a locked unit, where the children would come and they would be locked and they would serve 45 days with us. It was also a dual track program to where we also dealt with their mental, emotional, and family issues along with any chemical addictions that they may have. I've been a part of it. I've served as a, a master addictions counselor. I've served as a uh, substance abuse professional with the Department of Transportation. I've studied this for years and years and years and what I'm going to be sharing with you this week are things that I never learned from scientific research. What I'm going to be sharing with you is from God. And He gives it to us. He reveals it to us. A power that is so awesome that nothing can compare with it. Hopefully the things that we'll be talking about today will not only apply to addictions, but just life in general. To actually have an awesome life, an abundant life in all areas. But we're going to be specifically applying them to the idea of addictions this week. I would like to ask you to consider that the underlying problem of all problems that we experience in this world as human beings is selfishness. Is selfishness. There are hundreds of theories of psychotherapy that talk about trying to help people make changes in their life. Every one of those theories, every one of those theories talk about helping people make changes within their nature so that we can be happy, self-discipline, self-control, have inner peace, feel secure, have meaning and purpose, have hope. Because my undergraduate work and the initial part of my graduate work was in biblical studies and Greek exegesis, when I went and started studying the behavioral sciences, I would always ask when I would study these theories, so what does God say about that? And what's really interesting is that God is all about change too. Everything in the Bible is about helping us to change so we can have hope, so we can be joyful, so that we can feel secure, so that we can have meaning and purpose in life, so that we can be self 
discipline and have self-control. But what's really interesting is that the change that the Bible talks about is not change within our nature. It's actually changing our nature. We become a new creature. We become a new creation. Our selfish nature changes to an unselfish nature. And God is the definition of unselfishness. So when we allow God to change our nature, then we can overcome the selfish behaviors, the selfish ways of thinking, the selfish ways of, of living and choosing and making choices and decisions. We can change. We can change. There's only one power that can change our nature. You can't change your nature. Science and psychology cannot change your nature. Therapists, groups cannot change our nature. There's only one power that can change our nature. And that's the power of God. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on this week, Lord willing. I'd like to ask you to consider in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, Paul has two prayers. This is the second of his two prayers. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, agape, this is unselfish, that you being rooted and established in agape love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Why? So that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or even imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. There is a power that's available to us that changes us. It can accomplish in us, Paul says, that it can achieve within us things that we can't even imagine that can be achieved. Changes that we can't even imagine that can occur. That our life can become so rich and wonderful that we couldn't even, we can't even pray for it. We can't even ask for it. It's that great. And it's this power that Paul prays that, that these Christians can have. It's the power that's available to us. And it allows us to experience all the fullness of God. In other words, it allows us to become more and more and more like God. And God is the definition of unselfishness. I'd like to read another passage in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 16, Paul says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now the acts of sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is what our old nature produces. But what the Spirit of God, God in us, allowing the Spirit of God to unite with our spirit, what it produces is the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. We live by the Spirit, so let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Only God can change our nature. But I'd like to ask you to consider that we have to do our part. You see, in this nature change, God does not change us unless we allow Him to change us. Look, if we will, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 17. Here the Apostle Paul says, So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Why do they live that way? In the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, in other words, their conscience was seared, they have given themselves over to sensuality to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. They're never satisfied. It's never enough. Something's always missing. Notice what he says about the Christians. So he says, I want you to change. I want you to do your part. I don't want you to live like the Gentiles do. Why do they live that way? Because they got stinking thinking. Their hearts darkened. They don't know the truth. They're living in the darkness that Satan promotes. And we'll talk more about this, Lord willing, later on this week. But he says to these Christians, You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So you see there is God's part. He's going to be giving us the power. He's the source of life. But we have to do our part. We have to be willing to allow the spirit of God to unite with our spirit. If we're not doing our part, nothing's going to change. We'll talk more about our part a little bit later. Finally, I'd like to ask you to consider that not only is there God's part and our part, only God gives the increase. Only God gives the increase. I'd like to ask you to consider that, yes, like in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, the Hebrew writer says, let's go on into perfection. Let's, let's grow. Let's leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Notice what he says in verse 3. He says, let's go on to perfection. Let's continue to seek to grow. Let's do our part. But he says, this we will do if God permits. So I'd like to ask you to consider that sometimes God allows us to continue to be weak, to never completely overcome challenges, issues, weaknesses that we have. But it's for our benefit. It's for our benefit. Last verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is what Paul teaches. He says in verse 7, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You and I don't know what's best for our soul. God does. Here, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan that tormented him, and he pleaded with the Lord to take it away from him, and God said, no. No. I want what I choose to give you. I want my kindness to be enough for you. I want my grace to be sufficient. Trust me. Trust me. Paul says that if he would have had that thorn in the flesh removed, he would have probably become very, very, very conceited. And that conceitedness would have taken him away from God. So I'm going to ask you to consider that in in our process, our new creature process, our sanctification, perfecting holiness process, as the Bible refers to it, it is a lifelong process. There's God's part and our part. But God determines to give the increase when and how and to what extent. So our peace can come not from knowing that I've overcome an addiction or I've been able to change a behavior, I've been able to overcome a weakness, but it comes from knowing that as long as I am seeking to do my part, God will give the increase in his time. Satan wants us to only have peace whenever we get to where we think we have to be. God says, I want you to be able to have peace in the process of becoming. Peace in the process of becoming. Learn to love yourself in the process. Learn to love others in the process. Thank you so very much for this opportunity that you've given me. I look forward to sharing again my understanding of God as it relates to the nature changing power to help us to have the answer for overcoming addictions. If you're not a Christian, you're not a child of God, you're missing out on that tremendous power. I encourage you this morning, if you know what to do, Be a child of God. Let Him be your loving parent. You can trust Him. If you need to come, please do so as we stand and sing the song selected.